was uh, I think I was 28 or 29 when I first started training jujitsu. Mm-hmm. Um, those that was mostly just taekwondo and kickboxing. I really got into kickboxing, and I was entered. I I had three kickboxing fights, and I was entertaining the idea of fighting professionally. But I was also starting to get really worried about brain damage. Uh, I started to see some from signs ki- from kickboxing specifically. Yeah, specifically because it was I was getting hit a lot more. Oh yeah. Um, the the kickboxing sparring that I did, and I did that over the course of about two years, where I really got heavily into kickboxing. I did a lot of boxing sparring and a lot of what you would call gym wars, where guys would just we would beat the shit out of each other, and you'd get hurt and you'd come home with headaches and. You basically were fighting in the gym. I mean, it's not a wise way to do it. The, the smart gyms now and the best martial artists, they very rarely spar hard. They Most of the time, they spar technically. So they're, they're hitting each other, but they hit each other like this. They don't, they don't blast each other full blast. They sort of touch each other. They're working on timing, and occasionally you go hard just to make sure that you, you can survive with these techniques in a firefight that you know how to deal with it once you get hit. But um, we didn't- right, And is the, the, is the lower combat intensity still, in, still useful for training for the real thing? Yes, it's, it's, but you have to have some high intensity and some people that that high intensity, they actually have drills that they use to, to sort of st- um, to simulate actual uh, exchanges that you would have. There's a lot of science to it now that didn't exist back then. The, the gyms that I came up in were real hard nose, really, you know, tough gyms. And right, right. If, you, if you weren't tough, you did not survive. And they weren't interested in anybody that couldn't take a shot or anybody that wasn't willing to go to war. So you would put on a mouthpiece, you put on a cup, you put your shin pads on, and you beat the fuck out of each other. And that was a big part of uh, learning how to fight. It was these sparring sessions were brutal. They were nerve wracking. You'd be scared. You'd be scared going into them. They'd be, uh, you know, I'd you'd be anxious the night before if I knew how to spar a particular guy the next day because I knew it was dangerous. You basically were having fights all the time. So I'd have fights several days a week. You would fight. You know, right. it wasn't really sparring. You'd hit, I'd hit guys Christ, as hard you, as I could. You're covering a lot too, man. All the time, yeah. I think, from that. So, okay, yeah, now, you're just a big hole in this story, too. So, like, you're doing great at Taekwondo. You go, you're a national-level athlete, and you switch to kickboxing. You're worried about getting hurt, and that seems reasonable because, like, how about not being brain damaged by the time you're 30? But then, you know, <laughs> I guess kind of what I'm wondering was, like, how many shots in the head did you have to take before you thought being a stand-up comedian was a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> well... Um, one of my dear friends to this day is a guy named Steve Graham. And, uh, Steve was, uh, when I met him, I was 15 and he was probably 30 and he was going through his residency as an ophthalmologist. And, um, he had been a flight surgeon in the U S air force and just, uh, he would, he had been on the U S ski team. He was a national skiing champion just a wild man, just a guy who took chances and lived life to the fullest and was uh, uh, just one of the most hardworking people I ever met in my life. And uh, I would make him laugh. And I would make some of the people laugh in training because we were always nervous. Every When we would go to tournaments, we were nervous because, you know, I'd seen many of my friends get knocked unconscious at these tournaments, get kicked in the head taken to hospitals and you know i'd seen it in the gym too a lot of guys getting beat up and knocked out in the gym it was constant and you know and you know and it happened to me a couple of times i'd been hurt and so we had this gallows humor mm-hmm. where um we would go to these events we would travel to these tournaments and everybody would be the tension would be so thick everybody would just dig, taking deep breaths and trying to relax and just stay loose before you fight and i would be the I would be the class clown in hmm. that environment. And had you, you know, ever seen also, any of that when you were in high school or junior high? Like, would you? No, ever, like, I didn't no. have that. So, no, it but took I did. Those I circumstances. Did, yes, I did have a sense of humor, but it would manifest itself in cartoons. I would draw like cartoons as a teacher. You know, I would like draw cartoons of like certain kids that would kiss the teacher's ass. I would draw them like kissing the teacher's ass and saying ridiculous things. And if the teacher was late to a class and you know and I knew I had enough time I would put something 
on the chalkboard and then pulled down the screen so that when they would go to use the chalkboard, the chalkboard, they would pull the screen back up and see this ridiculous cartoon that I had drawn. The whole class would laugh and then you know, the teacher would ask who did this. And luckily nobody ratted me out. But uh, so I, that I enjoyed making people laugh, but uh, that was, it wasn't, it wasn't most, it mostly wasn't things I said it was mostly right. cartoons. Right. But right. then That's when, very different. Yeah. Yeah. But with comedy, with, with, with the, the fighting, when we were getting ready to compete, I was just trying to add some levity. I was just trying to lighten up the mood because yeah. everybody was, and it was also, it was a charged environment. So anything that I said that was actually funny would get a giant reaction and that became addictive. And I was pretty good at doing impressions. So I do impressions of our friends, do impressions of our instructor, all these in ridiculous situations. And my friend, Steve Graham, and my other friend, Ed Shorter, who's another one who encouraged me, who I lost touch with, unfortunately. Um, he, he said, you should be a comedian. And my take on it was, you think I'm funny because you're my friend. Uh, but other people are going to think I'm an asshole. Like, the things that I think are funny are fucked up. Right. Like, I have a fucked up sense of humor. I mean, here I am devoting most of my time to trying to get really good at knocking people unconscious. I mean, that's what I was, that was, that was, what I was trying to do. I was trying to separate people from their consciousness. That was, I was doing my best every day to get good at that. So my It's like a really of, perverse psychedelic drug. Yeah, it was, a, it was the worst. Yeah. But it was, I was trying to hurt people. That's what I was trying to get good at. I was trying to get good at hurting human bodies. And I just didn't think, I thought that I was such, an, uh, such a weirdo and such an outlier in terms of like how society viewed uh, combat, physical hand-to-hand comp -hand combat and interactions with each other that no one would think that the things that I was making fun of were funny. And this guy convinced me to go to an open mic night. He's like, you should go to an open mic night. Just go. There's a lot of comedy clubs in Boston. Go and watch. And I went and watched. And I realized, wow, one of the things about going to open mic night is most open mic comedians are so terrible that it encourages you to try it. Because uh -huh. you're like, well, I can't be that bad. Like, it, the, I, I might have something that's better than some of these people. And then, you know, you'd see a real professional go up and you'd, it would be so discouraging because you'd say, like, God, my God, I'll never be that funny. That, that guy's impossibly funny. Uh, but I knew from martial arts that if I worked really hard at something, I could get good at it. And I had this thought that maybe I could do that with comedy because I didn't want to fight anymore. I was already, I was already on my way kind of out the door. I was really worried about the brain dead. I was on my way out the door from the time I was like 19. From the time I was 19, I was starting to worry about brain damage. And then, well, so you're how like you're 53? I'm 51. 51, 51. And so much, how much damage did you actually sustain? You know, like lots of people. I don't do. know. I don't know. I mean, uh, I seem to be okay. How about physically, muscularly, and that sort of thing? Oh, no, I'm fine. I had a bunch well, of surgeries. Good. I've had my nose repaired. My nose was destroyed. I, I had no nose. Like the inside of my nose was just didn't work until I was 40. And then I, I had a deviated septum operation. They had to cut out giant calcified chunks of scar tissue and all sorts of, I literally, my nose was useless until I was 40 years old. Um, so that, that had, must have been kind of a relief to have your nose. Oh my God. I tell everybody, <laughs> get it done. If you have a deviated septum and you can't breathe out of your nose, my God, this, oh, I couldn't do that until I was 40. Yeah. And it was just all broke. I had broke my nose who knows how many times, at least a dozen. And it would just was always bloody. I was always getting punched or kicked in the nose. Yeah, and, it doesn't um, seem designed as a sense organ to be at the, in the middle of your face where you get punched. Well, it's, it has this flaw. little tiny piece of cartilage too. It this should be on the top so of your head, delicate. you know? It'd be a lot safer <laughs> up there. Yeah. Like a whale. Well, it also makes your eyes swell shut. It makes your eyes water. It makes it difficult to see when you get hit in the nose. Getting hit in the nose is, is really annoying. Um, but other than that, I had both my knees reconstructed. I had ACL tears in both knees. I had to get them them reconstructed and, you know, a bunch oh, of yeah. other stuff. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. So you took your... A bunch of other broken your, things. Yeah, broke broke yourself up pretty good. Feet. 
yeah, broken knuckles and I, I broke a lot of stuff, oh. but, uh, but everything works great now. I mean, after surgery and I mean, for a person who's been through what I do, what I've done with my body, my body works remarkably well. Yeah, it's amazing, and, actually. You know, that's a lot. Yeah. You know, you'd think you'd be arthritic, at least in some of your joints and that sort of thing. No, I'm, I'm pretty good. I mean, I also am very proactive. I do a lot of yoga. I've had a bunch of stem cell therapies to deal with uh, some significant tears and injuries that I've had. But all that you know, knock on wood, everything works pretty good. But the brain damage thing is, I don't know. I really don't know. I really sit, th sit back and think about some of those wars that I was in, yeah. the gym wars in particular, and some fights. And my last fight, I got TKO'd. I got stopped. I got hit with a left hook and dropped. And uh, my legs went out from under me. And then I got up and I get hit again, fell down again. They stopped the fight. And uh, that was when I decided I'm going to stop. I was like, I'm not giving this the same amount of dedication I gave when I was at my best. I was yeah. spreading myself way too thin with comedy. And I, I just didn't, I didn't have this same hunger for it that I had when I was young or younger. And I was also very aware of the consequences at that point in my life. I was like this, I know where this is going. I, I, I saw guys at the gym that were punch drunk, you know, uh -huh. that were right. slurring their words and they would forget things. And, and I had seen some people progress towards that. And it was very, very disturbing to me. You know, I'd be lying in bed at night after a hard sparring session. My head would be pounding. Uh -huh. And I would think, what am I doing to my fucking brain? Like, what am I doing to myself? And um, I got real lucky that I found stand-up comedy. I mean, if the UFC was around back then, I most certainly would have started fighting. And, uh, you know, and, and to not be training intelligently because I wasn't training intelligently. I was training like a meathead. And that was just all we knew back then. I probably would have sustained some pretty significant damage before I ever even got into the octagon. I probably would have already had massive brain damage before I ever had a fight. Right, right. So you, so, well, that's good. So you, you stepped out at an intelligent time. And so then you started yeah. your comedy career and you started at open mics. And so like, yeah. tell me about how that developed. Well, open mic nights are very interesting. You sign up on a list, and you may or may not get on. Uh, they, they pick people out of a hat. Like, say, if there's 50 people sign up, 30 people get on. And, uh, you know, you each do five minutes. And, you know, the, the host is generally a professional comedian that brings people up. And, you know, you have this weird culture of people that are struggling to try to figure out how to make a living in this sort of uh, undefined art form. There's no classes you can take in it that are really worth anything. There's no books that you can buy that are going to teach you anything. It's something that you kind of have to. The only thing that I liken to is rap music because rap music seems to be very similar in the fact that you have to learn from other practitioners. You don't really learn from books. You don't, there's no like, I mean, maybe there is now. I don't know of any like real legitimate university courses on stand up comedy. Um, I, I don't think they could teach it to you anyway because everyone does it differently. But I think that's the case with rap music as well. I think you kind of have to learn from the people that are already doing it. And one good thing about stand-up comedy, particularly today, uh, today it's much more open and inviting. And um, comedians have a lot more camaraderie than they did in the beginning because they're not fighting over scraps anymore. Now there's so many venues, so many different places to work. And then there's YouTube and the Internet. And um, comedians, there's much more of a supportive community of people trying to help people. And I, I try to really concentrate on that. I spend a lot of time trying to help young comics. Uh, I put a lot of young comics on my shows. I have them host. Um, you know, uh, I've got a show tonight, and uh, a young comic's only been doing it for a few years. Her name's uh, Allie Mikofsky. She's the host of it. She's really funny. And I try to encourage them. I try to help them. I try to give them advice. I try to give them pointers. I try to, when they have great sets, I try to, you know, really thank them and say that was excellent and you got this just keep keep doing what you're doing and you can really make a career doing this because it's such a insecure business it's just so it's such a weird undefined path that you have to take and it's, it's and i love the art form i love it as a consumer i love it as a person who's an audience member i really still to this day enjoy watching stand up but back then it wasn't that supportive. There was, you know, we would just support each other, but the, the professionals weren't that supportive. Not like they are today. A few people, like, there's a guy named Lenny Clark that I'm still good friends with to this day. 
And I, I opened up for him. He was a Boston legend. And I was super fortunate to open up for him when I had been uh, doing comedy for about a year. And he gave me some great advice. And that meant the world to me. And he was actually on my podcast just last month. I love that guy. And, you know, he helped me out when I was really, really, I was 21. I was really, really young in my comedy career. And so you and, started putting the same amount of dedication into that that you had been putting into the martial arts. Exactly. Yeah, I just became obsessed with it. And I uh, just traveled all over the place doing, doing open mic nights. I mean, me and my good friend, Greg Fitzsimmons, we started out together. We're good friends to this day. We started out within a week of each other. And um, we, we used to travel all the way to Rhode Island. We would drive, you know, it was an hour plus drive to go down there just to do five minutes. And then we were at an open mic night for free. And they would drive all the way home and just dream about one day being a professional. That was the dream. The dream was to pay your bills by doing comedy. Imagine right. if that, that could, you could do comedy for a living. Like that was the dream. Would, I would never imagine that I'm doing what I'm doing now or I'm doing these sold out arenas. Like that, that wasn't even a hope. And not, it wasn't even like maybe if it goes well, I could do this. Maybe I could do that. That was never on the menu. And, you know, it's gotten to this really crazy astronomical place now that it's very hard for me to even imagine that that came out of those strange days in Boston, just traveling around to all these different weird comedy clubs and writing constantly and not knowing how to write, not knowing how to formulate a joke, having like m many more misses than hits. You know, a lot of bombing. I bombed all the time. I, I yeah, well, that's something on stage. as well, man. You, you know, you got to have that ability to to bomb and come back from it. I mean, because yeah, you, you're you're going to have a lot more misses than hits. That's for sure. That's an, a lot more. Yeah. So, especially what do you in the think, early days, what do you think accounts for that obsessiveness that you described? I mean, that's a negative way of putting it. I mean, obviously, you said that. You know, when you were in school, if you weren't interested, you weren't listening at all. But if you were interested in something, you were like laser focused. And that really came up in the martial arts. But it obviously manifested itself in the stand-up comedy, too. So what is it about yeah. you that, that, that enables you? What do you think it is about you that enables you to zero in on something like that to the exclusion of everything else? I don't know. I mean, I think some of it has to be attributed to the unhappiness in my childhood. Um, that when I would find something that I did get some joy out of, I would just concentrate all in on that. Um, mm. I think some of it also was like, I wasn't really raised with a lot of discipline and I wasn't really raised with a, a pat. I mean, my parents were both, my stepdad and my mom were both working all the time. Mm. So they, they didn't, they weren't really around to sort of tell me what to do or how to live. And they weren't really around to let me know that everything was going to be okay. They were always working. So they would come home from work at like six o'clock or something like that. And, you know, I'd been on my own all day. Me and my sister had been on our own all day. You know, we'd come home, we had a key, we got into the house. And it was uh, when I, I, there was a lot of real bad feelings, you know, like, and when I found something that made me feel good, I just did that exclusively. That's all I did. And I, I still have that problem to this day. Uh, when I get obsessed with something, if I find something that means something to me, I, uh, I think of it all day long. If, uh -huh. if I get obsessed with something, it becomes, it becomes uh, like a, a mantra that's in the back of my head. And I, 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 I have to shut it off. Like, I have to do my best to shut it off. Otherwise, I can't listen to people. I don't, like, mm -hmm. I, like, when people are talking to me, I don't want to talk to them. I want to go do that thing that I want to do. Right, right. You right, know, and it, it right. becomes like a, a compulsion. And it could be socially negative, you know. It could be uh, detrimental to relationships and friendships. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it seems but, like that sort of thing is also absolutely necessary if you're going to develop high-level skill at something difficult and unlikely because – yeah. Unless you're obsessive about it and practice it like all the time, the the people you're competing with are gonna they're gonna take you out. So well, the funny thing I would always be terrified that I would run into someone like me. 
Well, I can understand that's what I'm that. Of. <laughs> but that's that was the fear that I would run into someone who is a hundred percent all in. And right. when I was fighting and when I lost my last kickboxing fight, I wasn't all in. And I knew I wasn't uh -huh, all in. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I knew I knew I wasn't the same person I was when I was like 18, 19. I was a psychopath. I mean, I was one hundred percent committed to doing nothing but that. And then um, as I was examining my future prospects in my life and I started to become more aware of the problems of what I was doing, I became less and less. I, I had one fight that I had in California, in Anaheim, in the U.S. Nationals in 1980. It must have been my hmm, – it seems like it had to have been 86, 86 or 87, somewhere around there. 87 somewhere around 87 i i knocked this guy out with a, a head kick and i did in front of his parents and it was it was everybody was people were crying and he was unconscious for a long time he was unconscious for a solid half hour Ooh. and they dragged him they dragged him off of the uh the mat they put him in a stretcher they took him to the hospital i never saw him regain consciousness and uh I remember thinking that could have easily been me. Like I didn't have any illusions of me being some impervious, in, invulnerable person. And I was really thinking about how I, I, I hit him so hard. My heel was hurting the next day. I was walking with a limp from his head because I wheel kicked him in the head. It's a particularly brutal move where you spin and your, your, your whole leg comes around. And you're hitting someone in the head with your heel. And he felt like he had gotten shot just fell face first out cold snoring it wasn't the first time that i'd done that to someone but it was one of the most brutal because he kind of ran into it too he was trying mm -hmm. to kick me as i was kicking him so it was the force of his body coming towards me and me hitting him and i was thinking that guy's probably never going to be the same again like he's never going to get over it psychologically or if he does it's going to be very hard for him but he might he might be damaged for the rest of his life. That's a real possibility. And then I started thinking, am I willing to have that happen to me at 19? I was 19 years old. I was like, is this, is this what you want to do? Do you want to get hit in the head like that and never be the same again at 19? Cause it easily can happen. You know? Yeah. Um, that's a, we were at a, 60 years to live like that. Yeah. We were at a, this was a national championship tournament. So he was a state championship, I think from Illinois and I was a state champion from Massachusetts. And, um, you know, it wasn't like he was, he was a black belt. I mean, it wasn't like he was an unskilled guy. So the fact that I was able to do that to him and I was able to do that to a bunch of other guys, I knew that someone out there could do that to me. Right. I knew, right. That, I, knew that I wasn't the best in the world. And I knew that even though I was uh, a top, I was, you know, I was a real national level competitor. I wasn't world class. I wasn't the best especially at 19. Um, and so that doubt, that doubt stuck with me um, for the next couple of years. And it was, it was probably the first seed of uh, my new future was me hurting that guy and thinking about what that was going to be like if that happened to me. Yeah, well, that's a hell of a right turn you took there to go into comedy. So, okay, so how, now, you became successful as a comedian. So, you started playing in little clubs like stand-up comedians did and like yeah how, how'd you get your breaks and how'd your career develop how well long did it um it took a few years for me to get competent you know it took like two or three years for me to get competent and then three years in i got extremely fortunate again where i met my manager my manager who's my manager to this day he basically picked me up when i was an open mic comedian I mean, I was, I was getting a few paid gigs here and there, but I was really an amateur. Um, and he found me. He was looking for new talent. He came up from New York. He, is, he was a, like, you know, really well-respected and well-recognized manager, still is, of course. His name is Jeff Sussman. And we've been together for, um, shit, now it must be 28 years. Yeah, we've been together since, really, since I was an amateur. And he no, that's, uh, a, that's a successful collaboration to to span that amount of time. Not many changes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've been together forever. We've been together forever. We don't even have a contract anymore. 
Hmm. We haven't had a contract, I think, for like 10 years. So during all this time, this is just like a bit of a side side question here, but you ever have any time at all to pursue relationships with women? No, oh, yeah. Well, you do comedy. You know, you're in clubs at night. Yeah. You, know, you yeah. have most of your day to do whatever you want. You know, to just when I was just a stand-up comedian, I had a lot of free time. You know, I mean, you're writing jokes, but you can only do that a couple hours a day or you get bored and then it's not effective. And then you're just kind of living your life and hanging out. And sometimes the best way to develop your comedy is to have good social interactions. It's actually kind of important when you're uh, an aspiring comedian to be in a lot of social situations because you are around people, you hear people say things. And then you think what they say is silly or what they say is, you know, you disagree or you agree. You, you see perspectives and points of view and you kind of you, you develop, you know, a, a, an understanding of how human beings behave. It's kind of very important. So, yeah, I, I, I was around a lot of different girls and a lot of guys and just being out. And, and you're always at comedy clubs and nightclubs, but I didn't right. I didn't go out other than that you know I, if i wasn't at a comedy club at night i probably wasn't out you know mm -hmm. it was always the same thing with like my obsession with fighting and fighting came way easier for me than stand-up did stand-up was way harder for me it was way harder it was way what, harder what, to what achieve was harder confidence. what was harder about it well you said it took you two or three years to get competent so that was a lot of falling flat on your face i presume yeah and even then, even like three years in, I still could bomb at any moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I could have a bad set. I didn't know how to do it. For, uh, also, I was socially awkward. I think it took me a while to, uh, to not, be, not be so socially awkward. You know, that was, that was an issue. And, you know, uh, it was a lot of it was from my upbringing. But a lot of it was also, I kind of cultivated that when I was fighting. Yeah, I, I didn't want people to like me. I didn't care. Hmm. Like, I didn't need them to like me. All I needed them to do, I mean, I kind of wanted them to be scared of me, you know? I, so when I was fighting, I wasn't trying to make friends out there at all. I was, uh, I was just trying to fuck people up. I mean, so so when, when you were fighting, when you were fighting, did you have any relationships with women? Or, was it, or were you pretty Not much good people? ones. Not no. good ones? No. I didn't. I wouldn't allow them to do, I, w I wouldn't allow them to have much of my time. You right. know, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I think to have a successful relationship, you have to spend a lot of time together. You have to communicate. You have to, you, the, the person has to almost be first place in your life. Yeah. And that was yeah, never, yeah. that was never happening. And so that was, that would come up very often. Like I was a girl that I was dating in high school. Uh, and, you know, I, I used to teach at the school, so I had keys to the school. So um, one time I took her up there because uh, I needed to get a workout in. And she wanted to have sex at the gym. And I was like, there's no way. I wouldn't do it. I was like, this place is sacred. Like, there's no chance. So she was trying to fool around. And I was, and I was adamant. I was like, this is never happening. Like, hmm. this, might, this might as well Jesus. be a church to me. I was like, it's not happening. And, you know, I was so horny when I was 17 years old. <laughs> to yeah, yeah, me, that's... at 17 or 18, to say no to sex was crazy. Right, right. Like, that's a crazy not story. Happening. I think we're going we're gonna to clip that and, and put it in a little clip that says, Joe Rogan tells a story that no sane man would believe. <laughs> well, I, you know, I was, that was the first refuge that I had from my life of despair. So for me, I wasn't going to screw that up. Right, 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 right. And I felt like disrespecting the, the, the academy like that. Yeah, well, they have been would... treating you like an adult. That's something, yes. that's something when you're a teenager, you know, like to actually be treated that way. It's a good thing not to mess with if you're fortunate enough to have it. Well, I wouldn't even walk onto the training floor by myself with no one around without bowing. Uh-huh. I mean, there was no one there, but I would never leave the the common area and step onto the training floor without bowing first right never never right. never okay so when you're in comedy now you said you, you said you were all in as a fighter and you figure you went all in as a comedian too and did you do that right from the beginning yeah yeah pretty much yeah right away as soon as i realized that i could actually do this and as soon as i realized i decided 
I mean, my first set that I ever did, I had a bunch of my friends come down and watch me, and I wasn't good the first time I ever got on stage. But I got a couple of little chuckles and laughs. And then I realized this might be possible. I might be able to do this. And then I became obsessed with figuring out how to do it. Because it was, I, I saw it as a path. Like, okay, this is a thing. Like, this is a thing you could do that you actually love. Like, I was a huge fan of the art form. I loved watching it. Um, ever since my, my parents took me to the movies when I was like 14 or 15, we saw live on the Sunset Strip. It was a Richard Pryor movie uh, in, in the theater where he did stand up. And I had never seen that before. And I remember thinking, how crazy is it that this guy could just talk? And it's so funny. I was falling out of my chair laughing and I was looking around. I remember looking around while the movie was playing at all these people in their chairs, just rocking back yeah, and forth yeah, yeah. and laughing so hard. Yeah, it's really something it's amazing. I saw Especially when you're a young teenager. Like 16? I know you should oh, really? talk about Bill Cosby, but I saw him live. And like I saw him live too when I was a security guard. Oh yeah? I saw him live yeah, I was a security guard at, at Great Woods. Uh I saw Kinnison there when I was a security guard. I saw Rodney Dangerfield there. Yeah, I saw quite a few people there. Yeah, well it was something to see him sit on his stool with his cigar and get the whole audience like literally hysterical. I mean, the guy in front yeah. of me was rock, rock, rocking back and forth so hard he could hardly breathe. His wife kept elbowing him to get him to kind of, <laughs> you know, turn back into something vaguely resembling a human being. But it was, it was really amazing to see someone with that much command of the audience and, and so consistently, unbelievably funny. He's so. the most tragic story in all of show business. Man, it's I had to, Next to Michael Jackson and O.J. Simpson. I mean, those are the, the three most tragic stories in show business, in, in my mind. Yeah. And, and you know, he's a monster. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, I know. And you brilliant think, what, comedian is a What monster. the hell? You know, the thing that's so strange about Cosby, you'd think, well, like, was this really necessary? Like, man, the guy was famous in 15 different directions and really well respected. You wouldn't have think he would have had yeah. to date rape his women. You know, it's just. Well, yeah, I mean, he, if he just, he could have just had prostitutes. I mean, if he really just needed sex, I don't think that's what it was. No. I think there was a sick perversion, and I think he liked to do that to people. He liked to trick them. I mean, I'm just guessing, right? Well, it has to be something like that because it's something. so it's so counterproductive and so psychotic. It's psychotic. I mean, I don't understand it. You know, no, I've tried to, I've tried to sort of imagine what it must have been like to be around in the '50s and the '60s. I think people did that to each other way more often than we'd like to admit. And I think that it was more casual than we would think of today where people would slip someone a Mickey or, you know, I mean, he even had a bit that he did back in way back in the day about giving someone Spanish fly that you'd give someone something that would make them horny. Right. I think he, I think he was probably a guy that had an incredibly inflated opinion of himself. Didn't want anybody to ever reject him experienced that a few times again this is pure speculation and just decided that he was better than people that he could just drug them it's, it's so insane. strange though because his comedy was basically so like it was generally family oriented it was yes you know and he put himself forward as a role model and he was credible like he was credible as an actor as a role model and he seemed credible as a spokesperson is kind of kind of makes me think you know there's this idea that the psychoanalysts had this guy named Eric Neumann, who was a student of Carl Jung's. And one of the things that Neumann said, he wrote a book called Depth Psychology and the New Ethic right after World War II. And it's a, it's a great book, a little thin book, but it's a great book. And one of the things he says in that book is, don't be better than you are. And what he meant was, he didn't mean don't improve, like mm. that would be foolish. He meant beware of adopting a persona that makes you a far better person than you actually are because all of that part of you that you're not admitting to that's going to go off and have its own life because mm -hmm. you're not integrating it you know you're suppressing it in some way and you're not it and and so it's a living thing you know that well like the aggression you had when you were a fighter that's a big deep part of you you know you can't just push something like that aside and pretend that it's not there and think that it's not going to go off and have some fun when you're not paying attention. Yeah. To me, like something like that must have got him is that he was, 
he was split between this really mm. good guy that he was trying to be, which was like too good, and 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 this this like more monstrous side of his personality that he obviously never integrated or perhaps never even admitted to. It's really a hell mm. of a story, man. It's like, and it really is a catastrophe. I think it was an yeah. absolute bloody catastrophe for his victims, yeah. obviously, and but just as a general cultural phenomenon, it's so awful. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it, you, you know, you, they say you should separate the man from the art, but in his case, it's almost impossible to do because his art was his perception of life. So, like when you're watching him, it's not like a painter or even someone who makes a movie. It's like when you're watching him, you're watching him now and all you can think of as he's talking about these different things and about, I told my children, well, he's like, he's doing this lovable dad yeah. voice. And yeah. you know, so all you can think of, is, that guy rapes people. Yeah. He drugs them and rapes them. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I can't enjoy it anymore. Yeah. And he's unquestionably, as, as far as like his skill, he was one of the greatest of all time. Yeah, yeah. All right, so yeah. you got you got a manager and you got a good one. And what happened? Yeah. Uh, I moved to New York and then uh once I moved to New York, I started doing a ton of stand-up comedy. Uh I was traveling all over the place and I got better and better and I kept working on it, working on it and just doing a lot of gigs and just going all over the place and and then um a so few how years old later you, how old were you were about how old were you by the time you were like paying your bills cuz that was your first marker for success probably like 26 25 26 was when it all started coming together oh yeah so um, that's not too bad that's not too yeah bad. i mean i wasn't not old enough making to be a lot of money i was making enough money to eat and pay my rent um, and then um, somewhere around then, I did a thing called the MTV Half Hour Comedy Hour. That was a, uh, a it was a television show they had on MTV. And each comedian, I mean, I don't know how much time I did on the show. I think you do like seven to ten minutes or something like that. It wasn't a lot of time. And I had a set and uh, I did it on television. It went really well. And then uh, next thing you know, I got all these offers to do television shows. I got development deal offers. And then before you know it, I'm living in California. It was like that. I mean, within a year, I was living in California and I was on a sitcom. And, uh, and then that sitcom got canceled. And uh, I thought I was going to move back to New York. It was called uh, Hardball. It was Hardball. A, a baseball show on Fox. It was a sitcom about a baseball team. Um, that show got canceled, and then uh, I got a development deal with NBC. I was going to move back to New York, but I had signed a lease uh, for my apartment. I, I hated L.A. I hated actors. I didn't like it. I didn't, mm. it, was so, it was so disingenuous. The worlds that I had come from were the worlds of stand-up comedy, which is about as real as you can get. Either you're funny or you're not. And then the world of fighting, which was even more real than that. Um, so, and then all of a sudden, I was around all these people that were just full of shit and weird. And it was, the, they were put on these personas and they wanted the casting agents to like them and the producers to like them. And everything was fake and everybody knew it was fake, but they all accepted it and they talked fake. And, they, and it, was, it was very, very strange, very hard for me to deal with. I really didn't like actors. I didn't like being, and the only place well, that I sought refuge. It's a funny thing that, there'd be an automatic assumption that because you were a good stand-up comedian, that somehow you'd be an actor. Like, yeah. It seemed to be the same thing. No, they're not. But the thing is that a lot of comedians had gone on to be super successful in the world of sitcoms, like right. Roseanne Barr, Jerry Seinfeld, Tim Allen, those type of people. They had these huge careers, Brett Butler. So because of that, all that was happening at the same time. This was like in 94-ish when I got on TV for the first time. Um, and they, that was what they were pushing. And then agents and managers would push that too because obviously you can make a tremendous amount of money. So uh, that show got canceled, but I had a lease for this apartment. So I was kind of stuck in LA. So I was like, all right, let me just stay out here and uh, see what happens for a year. That was my thought. And then um, I got a development deal with NBC. They wanted to do a sitcom with me. And then I wound up auditioning for a show that they had already had called News Radio. 
And that was with Dave Foley and Phil Hartman and Maura Tierney and Candy Alexander and Stephen Root and Andy Dick and uh, Vicki Lewis. And we did that show for five years. And then, um, you know, by that time, uh, I had done a lot of stand up at the comedy store. When that show was canceled, Fear Factor came along and I was touring as a comedian. And now that's a whole still switch there. Okay, so now yeah. you go from sitcoms to Fear Factor. So how the hell yeah. did that happen? And why did well, you it happened? NBC came up to me with the idea because I was on NBC previously and they, they liked me. And then part of the thing was that I didn't want to work with actors anymore. <laughs> I was uh, I was happy that Fear Factor was no actors. And I was like, oh, good. This is easier to do. Um, it's just me talking to people. And since I had a background in coaching, because I had coached a lot of people at tournaments, uh, in competition, and I taught a lot at Boston University. I taught at my own school, um, I, you know, with Taekwondo. I was used to teaching people, and I was used to encouraging people and and getting people motivated. And I knew how to... I knew how to get fired up for competition. I understood. So you were actually and, you were actually one of the rare people in the world who was actually trained to be the right host for Fear Factor. Yeah, in a lot of ways. Luckily, fortuitously, because I, I like I would when someone was nervous and they're about to do something, I, I could grab them and go, look at me, you could do this. This is gonna define you. With you, if you back off right now and you get scared and you give in to your fears and your anxieties, this is going to define you. Or if you just press forward and realize you can do this and succeed, it will define you in a positive way and you'll build momentum in that direction. You can do this. And I, would, I was really good at giving people pep talks. I was really good at firing people up. And it was part of the gig that it was, like, it was uh, completely unexpected because I thought the gig was just going to be these people do these crazy things. and you know, I make fun of it, which is part of my job. And I, you know, we all cheer and, and it would all play itself out because it was a reality show. It was sort of a game show slash reality show. It was like a hybrid, but somewhere along the line, especially when they became really nervous, uh, it, 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 it was very intense. Huh. And there was moments where I really, I wanted these people to win. You know, I wanted these people to do their best. I wanted these people to succeed. You know, and to be yeah, able well, to encourage someone. Treating, man, and you know, from yeah. that's the basis of psychotherapy. So, you know, it's really something to get people to face their fears. I mean, you were doing it in a very idiosyncratic way, very a very uh, what unique way. But yeah, imagine it was, it was psychologically strange. compelling. Very often. Got any particular got any particular stories from that time? You got a good story from Fear Factor? Well, there was one time where there was this couple, uh, not couple, a family. It was a father and a son competing against a mother and the daughter. And the father and the son were kind of jerks, which was part of the competition. There was a lot of trash talking, but they were really cocky and they thought that they were going to win, you know, and it was, you know, they had this the parent and child teams had gotten down to two and it was the man and his son versus the woman and her daughter. And everybody thought these jerks were going to win and we were kind of bummed out about it. But the, the women, the woman and her child, you know, they just rose to the occasion. And I mean, I remember talking to them and firing them up, but I still, I didn't know if they could do it. What, what, was, what was the challenge? It was some crazy thing that they had to climb and do this thing. And the, the, I, I don't really remember all of it. Like they had to gather flags. It was all for time, but the son, the kind of jerky son, the jerky dad, they kept screwing up and they, they, they fucked up because, you know, they, they'd kind of taken it for granted that they were going to win. Uh -huh. And when the pressure hit them, they knew it was all on the line. A lot of times jerks are just insecure. And when they're under pressure, when they're really faced with real pressure, like this is the real moment. Who are you really? Fuck all that talk. Who are you really? They fall apart. And the mother and the daughter won. And you're talking about a hardened crew of people that had watched people eat 
animal dicks and jump out of helicopters for season after season, episode after episode. You know, we did a hundred and something shows, a hundred and I don't even remember how many shows, like probably 140 episodes of that show. Everybody cried. Hmm. The camera people, like I'll cry now if I'm thinking about it. Hmm. Hmm. When so the mother and the daughter won. It's so affecting. I mean, there's a it justice so component to it, right? There's a comeuppance. It was a comeuppance. It was an underdog. It was just seeing their spirit. You know, when, when they were figuring out a way to win, watching them win or to this day. I'll tell day, you, one of the things that makes me really happy about this interview <laughs> so far is that, like, I have a tendency to tear up in interviews, um, as you may have noticed, but this time it was you, so I'm, I'm quite pleased about that. It's yeah, a very I touching a story, lot. though, man. <laughs> you do, eh? Yeah, yeah, but particularly like that. I don't yeah. tear up for sad things. I tear up for happy things. You know, yeah, that yeah, was a, yeah. That was well, a that's, happy that's an interesting thing to, to, to think about, too, because it's not exactly happy, right? It's because, you know, when these people come up to me and they tell me their stories, that often makes me tear up because it's like, it's like this blast of dead, bloody seriousness with a happy ending, you know? So it's, yeah. it's a comedy because it's a happy ending, but it's yeah. rough and affecting, and it, 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 that makes me tear up. And I, th I think my proclivity, I've always kind of had that ever since I was a kid, but it seems to have come back. Me too. With the, well, you too, eh? Huh. Yeah, yeah, always, always. But it's always been happy things. It's never been sad things. It's very hard to get me to cry with sad things. Sad triumph. things are sort of just, yeah, triumph, success. Yeah. Um, people pulling through, like uh, post-fight interviews when, I'm, when I work for the UFC, when someone has like a particularly incredible performance, I, I have the fight off tearing up. I feel so happy for them. Isn't, isn't, it, isn't it strange that it's that same response to sorrow? That's the same response to sorrow and triumph. That yeah, that, that tearing it is. Up, you know, like what the hell's up with that? I don't, I don't understand yeah. that at all. I mean, I well, guess it's, it's also kind of a sign of empathy. It, yes, it is definitely a sign of empathy. But it's what's also odd is that with sad things, I can, I can. I can objectively analyze them and uh, I, I cannot get sad. I can understand that this is just life and it is what it is. And mm. I mean, I won't feel good, but I won't start weeping. I don't weep for like sad things the way I weep for happy things. So you, that's interesting. So, so in some sense, you've, you've trained yourself to detach yourself from that kind of sorrow, but not to detach yourself from triumph. I can rationalize and understand sorrow. I can internalize it. I get it. I know. I know what it is, and uh, you know, I just get so happy for people sometimes mm -hmm. when things go well. Yeah, one of my guilty pleasures is I. I really like uh, America's Got Talent and the BBC <laughs> equivalent. What the hell's the BBC equivalent? Is it the X Factor? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it does the same thing to me. I'd see somebody schlub out there, schlub themselves out there on the stage, looking pretty pretty damn dreadful in about four different dimensions and then like knock it out of the park. It really, yeah, it's, it's really something to, it's yeah, really it's something, something to see. amazing. Well, yeah. cause I think we, per, as a human being, you realize how hard it is to overcome competition or these difficult moments. So these, these moments when you're tested and you know, there's fears and insecurities that these people have to battle as well as the actual physical task in front of them. There's so much going on, and it's, yep. there's so much anticipation and nerves and anxiety involved in that, that to see someone triumph. I mean, it's, I am a, a student of human will. I, I love stories of discipline and success. I don't yeah. like bad stories. I don't even like going to movies where they're sad. When people tell me about sad movies, I'm like, stop. I'm not going to that movie. I don't uh -huh. like it. I don't want to uh -huh. see it. I'm not interested. I know what sadness is. I've been sad. I get it. I'm not interested in getting that in a form of entertainment. I like success. I like I like seeing people triumph. I like I like that's, seeing the human spirit manifest itself in spectacular ways. Yeah, that's why I like my lectures. 
that's why it's so fun to do them, you know, because I'm out there trying to tell people that they have the opportunity to do that and to point out to them too that if they watch themselves, they notice they love that. Because, you know, that's yeah. one of the things. You go to a basketball game or a hockey game or something like that and somebody makes a spectacular play and it's a little celebration of the human spirit. Yeah ability yeah. to do something impossible in the moment and everybody's up on their feet like in one yeah. second go man go yeah and that's yeah like, that's that's uh the more of that the better as far as i'm concerned there's so much yep. concentration on our on our you know the destruction we wreak on the planet and our original sin and our weakness and that you know the terrible things we do to each other it's really nice to see those situations where people are celebrating the triumph of an individual in a group like that. And it really says something wonderful about human beings deep in their core for all of our problems. It's really something to be part of that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think we concentrate way too often and way too much on the negative aspects of people. You know, I mean, it's almost like sports is about the only place that doesn't happen. You know, it's kind of strange because you do concentrate on the positive in sports you celebrate the winners you know the cameramen don't go over and interview the losers you know i mean they'll yeah. talk and all that but and it, it's it, i don't know why it is that in sports it's okay to 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 celebrate the triumphant and the victorious but it is okay mm. and, and no one questions it it's it's or well that's not true because now they have like non-competitive games for kids and you know that's part of yeah. the politically correct curriculum but most of the Nonsense. time, most sane people will celebrate along with a victorious athlete, and that's really something. All right, so fear factor. How many years did that last? Six years. Were they good years? It was good financially. Yeah, well, that's something. <laughs> I, made, I made a ton of money, and it uh, alleviated financial pressure. But I enjoyed doing it some, somewhat, but it was not like the way I enjoy the other things that I do. It's not like I enjoy stand-up comedy. It's not like I enjoy working for the UFC. It's not like I enjoy doing podcasts. All those things that I just talked about, those three things, those things are labors of love. I, they're passions. They're things that I'm really genuinely fascinated by and interested in. Like this conversation, I would have this conversation with you if it was just you and me and there was no cameras. I would love to have this conversation. I love having conversations with interesting people. Um, I love stand-up comedy. I love all those things. I didn't love being there for Fear Factor, but it was a great job, and I knew it was a great job, and I knew I was really lucky to have it. So it was great in that respect. But when it was over, I kind of decided I was done with television. When it was over, I was like, okay, I think I'm done with this. No more of this. From like from here on out, I'm just going to concentrate on my own stuff. And so uh, from then on out, I just really focused on stand-up comedy. And that's when my comedy career really took off was post fear factor i mean i had a comedy career during fear factor but it really took off post fear factor because i really gave it all of my attention and so what was what what happened after fear factor that boosted you on the comedy on the comedy circuit um well i did uh, a special for comedy central and spike tv called talking monkeys in space in 2009 that was like probably my best work up until then and then, um, you know, from then I've been on a pretty steady pace of doing specials every two years or so ever since then. Right, right, right. And that's been successful nonstop. Are you getting better? Yeah, and it's, yeah, I think I am. I think I'm getting better. I think it's one of those things that as long as you keep concentrating on it and as long as you keep focusing on it, you're getting better. I think my hour that I'm doing now is as good as anything I've ever done. And it's not even done yet. It's only, you know, six months into this hour. But uh, I think it's some of my best work ever. And when I'm really excited out? to see where it comes. Well, I mean, pro there's no rush because it's only six months since my last one. I probably will work on this for another year uh, before I even think about recording it. Oh, yeah. So if it's good and now, it should be really good by then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, a, it's like a samurai sword. You're, you're folding the metal and hammering the blade yeah. and folding the metal and hammering the blade. And you got to know when it's ready. And I'll start to get a sense of where it's ready in about a year. In about one year, then I'll start going, all right, this seems pretty solid. Maybe it's time to rock and roll. And then uh, I'll contact Netflix and I'll say, uh, hey, let's do it. You know, let's, uh, let's set it up in whatever, whatever city I decide. And I'll just, I'll pick a city. I'll pick it. I'll just run it over in my head. I'll pick a name for it. 
you know? Well, maybe I'll try to stay posted on what you're doing and come down and see it. That'd be fun. Yeah. I missed Anytime, you the last man. time you were here in Toronto, but I'd like to come and see one of your shows live. I think that'd be a blast. So, yeah. Okay. Fun, so, the, so the next was the UFC, eh? Yeah. That was TV well, the too. The UFC kind of, the UFC happened while I was on news radio, actually. While I was on news radio, I started working for the UFC way back in 1997. Uh, but it was the UFC was more of a sideshow back then. It was uh, banned from cable. You could only get it on satellite TV. Right, and right. It was it was a freak show. People didn't know about it. I mean, I loved it because as a lifelong martial artist, to me, it was fascinating to watch all these different styles compete against each other. But um, it didn't pay much money. And even though it was enjoyable for me, it got in the way of other aspects of my life. And so I quit around 1998. And then